Good evening and welcome to Watchmen on the Wall. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we're going to show you a documentary produced by Family Watch International in the United States of America called The Porn Pandemic. This documentary uh, illustrates the devastating effect of pornography on men, women and children in society. After the documentary, my guest in the studio, Clive Human, from Standing Together to Oppose Pornography or Stop, we will discuss the harmful effects and the implications for South Africa. So watch this. This film exposes the addictive nature of pornography, how pornography addiction is a root cause of family breakdown, and how it drives violence and sexual crimes against women and children. This film is not intended, however, to imply that the majority of pornography viewers will end up committing sexual crimes, or that the individuals who appear in this film have committed such crimes, unless they specifically indicate so. If you or a family member struggle with a pornography addiction, please know there is hope and that many have found healing and recovery through therapy and family support. My first exposure to pornography was around age eight. I was uh, probably uh, eight or nine years old and I stumbled upon some uh, pictures of pornography. It was more when we, after we were married that he discovered it when we had it coming through our TV in a rapid, excessive, anytime, 24-7 hour rate. So my first experience with pornography was at my cousin's house and it was on this gaming device with internet connection and I don't think his parents even knew that it had internet connection. And so he was first exposed to pornography when he was seven or eight years old, he thinks. And a lot of times I'd hide him under my bed or, or in my dresser, that sort of thing, and I'd flip back to him. I felt naturally drawn to them. Go to the library. And, and, and try to find books that were exciting uh, of sexual nature. Like while you're looking at it, I, I suppose it's like a, it's thrilling, like it's, you know, it's awesome while you're in it, but then afterwards it's just, I guess this feeling of like disgust and shame and um, like, why did I just do that? You know, what was the point of that? And he did get in trouble even in kindergarten for having cut out like the underwear ads, he and his friend, and they had those on their desks in kindergarten. So one of the fascinating things that's been happening over the last 10 years is because of technology, we've been able to see how pornography and sexual addiction affects the brain. Pornography is a drug which produces an addictive neurochemical trap. It is a pheromone. It changes the set point, the pleasure set point of the brain, and creates a new normal through the process of neuroplasticity or change in the way our brain perceives and values pleasure. Learning about the addiction has been what has really helped me to realize that it's not me. It's not between me and some other woman. That this is something that's wrong with his brain. It's not just a morality issue, right? That this is a brain issue, that these behaviors affect your brain and your ability to be able to function in your life. But learning about the changes in the brain and the steps that can be taken to actually reverse those changes, that damage, that really gave me hope. So one transmitter is dopamine, and that's centered part of our pleasure and reward system of our part of our brain. And dopamine's released in it whenever there is a sexual experience and something that we, gives us a kind of a high in order for us to want to continue to seek out that same activity. Have anything bad happen to me, that would be my quick fix. And, you know, give me that dopamine rush, make me happy again, or at least numb the pain. It is as destructive, if not more so, than other even hard drugs. I had periods of time where I, I just gritted my teeth and, and white knuckled through it, but inevitably, I always fell back into it. As we're engaging in those behaviors, oxytocin and vasopressin is released, that bonds us to those activities. So we educate our clients about the neurological pathways, because this isn't just about their willpower or them being weak and not being strong enough. It's about the things that are going on in their brain. You're playing with fire 
uh, when you become uh, a watcher of pornography because you don't know how your brain is going to interact with pornography. You know, these are good men They're, and women, good people. These are not people who are going out looking for that. They're people who are coming across it innocently. So where they may have started off with some very basic pornographic images, it has a tendency to escalate, going to massage parlors, going to escorts, seeking prostitutes, looking to hook up with anonymous individuals online. Progression from nudity to hardcore sexual acts, bestiality, sadomasochism, child porn. What the brain is really searching for is something new. Novelty, change. Pornography capitalizes on that. It can extend to various things. Not everybody falls into all those categories, but each one of them falls into some category where it continues to escalate. Very rarely have I seen somebody who started with pornography and it just stayed basic pornography. So for me, I started out with just pictures and that was it that did it for me. And then it got progressively worse. It got stories, videos, intense videos, long videos, um, and there didn't seem to be an end. I had come to realize that it's not just men looking at pictures. It's, it's something that changes in the brain. And um, that was a real a page turner for me that I realized, okay, this is something that needs professional help. Now I'm a marriage counselor. About 90% of the people I see with marriage issues have pornography issues as well. And I'm convinced that that is the central cause the isolation, the shame, the dishonesty, the lies, that's the central cause of marriage disharmony today. As I told her, I remember just, just shaking. I, I broke down into tears. I was so ashamed of myself. Do I divorce him? Do I keep married? We have a child coming. You know, we're butting heads because I'm trying to say, what you did is terrible, crazy, terrible, and I'm angry, and I'm mad, and I'm... I'm like a cat in a cage. I'm just like, you know, I just want to, you know, tear him to pieces. And, and he's just trying to protect himself. You know, he's getting found out and he has other deeper, uglier things that he's hiding still. And all of this time, all of this money, all of this effort that has been put towards a sexual addiction, you could be something incredible. When he would do that, I would know what was going on, but he would lie about it continually. And then you start to not trust yourself. And this is the destructive power of pornography, that it disrupts our primary relationships. Without pornography, if an individual is distressed, their instinct sends them to their loving relationships, to a spouse or to a friend. Uh, but with pornography addiction present, uh, they go internal. They don't reach out, they reach in to themselves or their own sexual behavior. His story was more of a telling me, don't worry about it, every guy does it, every guy needs it, it's normal, it's healthy. I spent so much time trying to figure out what was truth and what was a lie, and I would look back at pictures and they would just make me sick because I thought, well, you were lying. And not only did I have to go get tested, he went and got tested when I was on the table, you know, gynecologist table, and we were going over what I could possibly have, you know, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes, and then she started talking about, we're gonna test you for HIV, we're gonna test you for AIDS. I don't think there is a time in my life when I've ever felt so defeated as a woman and a wife and a lover and a friend and a human being. So the problem is these men are viewing these images of women and have fantasies of these women that don't have any needs and are just there to fulfill their needs. And so when the real women in their lives have needs, they become angry and resentful about it. And Nicholas Tenbergen, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973, described a supernormal stimulus. He first started with birds. He painted bird eggs bigger and prettier than normal bird eggs and found that the birds would leave their own eggs and roost the plaster eggs because they were bigger and prettier. It was a, more, a higher, super normal over what they encountered in nature. Then he painted female butterflies' wings bigger and brighter than normal female butterflies, and these male butterflies actually mated or tried to with the paper female butterflies and ignored the real female butterflies. Nobody can compete with altered, fake, over-enhanced, and absolutely extreme pornography. 
You have this, this virtual attachment to, uh, to these artificial humans. It's not reality. And I think that's, that's the problem, is that the men get sucked into that and then they expect it. And then the women feel like that's what they need to be. And I don't want this dull, normal. I want exciting. I want new. I want enhanced. It dysfunction, erectile dysfunction result. Pornography is leading to sexual dysfunction. Psychology Today Online had an article uh, two years ago about something they called porn-induced sexual dysfunction. And what they said is it's a problem for guys in their 20s. They've been looking at pornography for 10 years by that time, masturbating to it, and that's imprinted on the brain. That's where they get their sexual excitement. We're finding men younger and younger are having difficulties with erectile dysfunction because what they have found arousing in the pornography they're not able to achieve in their experiences with women. I went through the days, but I wasn't living. I, you know, I looked at pornography every day in order to self-medicate. I would cut myself because I would so much rather feel physical pain than emotional pain. And My husband got to the point where he was so despondent. He thought many, many times about taking his own life. I hated myself. You know, hated God, hated everybody. You know, why me? Why, as a child, for crying out loud. Pornography images are resulting in a massive shift in the way our children are developing their sexual template. The premature sexualization of our youth is, is at an all-time high, and it's only going to continue to get higher based on the trends that we're seeing. You know, you become sexualized as a six, seven, eight-year-old kid, joking about it, kind of following the lead of what this pornography is taking you. Psychologists say that, uh, you know, it's not like uh, some casual observation that you see that flits on the mind and goes out. It's permanently imprinted on the mind. And those children, as much as they would like to, cannot escape those memories and escape those images. I still remember those images of what I saw as an eight-year-old child. Uh, I can't remember what I did last week, but I, these things I... They, they just stuck with me. But when they go to the internet with curiosity, they're not going to get healthy, good information about sexuality. What they're going to get is a vast array of pornography uh, that doesn't educate them well about what sex really is, about what relationships really are. They get the opposite. But children aren't in the capacity to make informed, long-term decisions about that. Again, we're learning much more about the brain. Children's brains are very uniquely unadapted to that. Remember, their frontal, frontal lobes aren't formed, and they're going to be able to process that and, and understand the, all the nuances and implications of the behavior later. It's ridiculous. Now, if you can think of anything deviant and dark, somebody else already has and has created a forum online to post it, to publish it, to promote it, to, to expose it. So I'm aware that there are these comprehensive sexuality education programs that are emerging out there that are teaching children to explore, engage in sexual behaviors and activities that are pleasurable and whatever they want to do. That kind of early exposure for children is damaging to their development, to their, both their social and sexual development that inhibits their ability to have healthy sexual, emotional relationships later on in life. When sexual freedom is the priority, when people are encouraged to begin sexual activity at an early age to explore and to experiment with different partners, then sexual health suffers. <laughs> It is a normal, natural response for your body to um, respond to another naked body that way. But it's just not the right time for someone so young. There's no stop valve. It's experience all the sex you want. If it were a cake, it would be eating a chocolate cake at every meal. Infection, cancer, infertility, unwanted pregnancy. It is primarily girls and women who suffer the consequences of early sexual activity in multiple partners. That's not sexist. That's biology. If they could put, connect the dots and see that our children are being sexualized so early that they are developing unhealthy body image and sexual relationship images of what that should be like. And an attempt to provide it for adults has fallen into the hands of 
children and uh, adolescents in a way that is seriously destructive to their own emotional and sexual development. There's no question that pornography leads to the denigration and the demeaning of women, no question. Because the ideation is such that women are subservient. Their job is to only satisfy men either as a slave or as a sexual toy or as a prostitute. A lot of people today, particularly in the United States, think of pornography as nothing more than skin flicks. And they dismiss it as people being too uptight, prudish, and so forth. If they say anything against pornography, they have absolutely no comprehension of the degrading aspect of so much of today's pornography. 14-year-old boy goes on his phone, text, sexts, different girls. His language was so obscene, so vulgar, calling them names that are inappropriate. Where did he get the ideation that this is all they are good for? It was pornography. And the objectification of women today, I think, is one of the major problems we face in cultures around the world. All these people that I was looking at, I was making them seem, you know, like sexual objects rather than people. It's surprising that many of those who are seeking to improve the status of women are passive or accepting of pornography, which is so demeaning to women. Shelley Lubin, who now works uh, on the good side and, and, and helps uh, fight pornography, former pornography actress, said many actresses admit, actresses admit they've experienced sexual abuse, physical abuse, etc. She says the same horrible violations we experience then we relive in front of the camera and we hate every minute of it. So also the bridge study showed of the top 250 porn titles, 90% of them depict violence against women as defined by slapping, hitting, hair pulling, gagging, choking, and name calling. The more violence and abuse that is depicted in pornography um, has a greater sell value on the internet Pornographers know this, and they push this. Do the men that watch that um, just decide, hey, um, I can watch this, but it's all fantasy. It's not real. It is real. The women are actually experiencing what's on the screen. So you need to understand that this is someone's mother. This is someone's daughter. This is someone's sister. And you wouldn't want your mother or daughter or sister to be viewed in that way. We know, for instance, from the HALT meta-analysis, which did look at multiple studies and did conclude that, yes, men who view pornography uh, are more accepting of the rape myth, that women enjoy rape and want it. Today, violence against women is, is on the increase. Rape is on the increase. In the UK, uh, the uh, government has identified uh, a, a substantial number of child-on-child -child victims who were harmed because of the pornography consumption of the perpetrator. I have had uh, cases where the pornography addiction in a, a man uh, progressed to the point where he violently raped his own daughter. Most of the individuals that I work with, their desire and appetite for, for seeking somebody like a prostitute can it had its origins in their exposure to pornography. Victims of prostitution and violence and, and trafficking will tell you that the industry has gotten so much more uh, difficult because the men are demanding much more violence than they ever did before. They seem out of control. They really don't want to be doing the things they're doing. They love their families and they want to maintain a level of love and connectedness there, but their compulsion and their addiction uh, through pornography drives them into these promiscuous relationships, to prostitution, and it's devastating to them. The pornography is fueled 
by the women who are trafficked. Uh, they're the ones who are used to make the movies that are so popular that, you know, the videos are sold around the world. More than 11,000 a year are uh, developed in comparison to 400 that, uh, movies that are produced in Hollywood. Ultimately, I, I realized he'd been with these women from another country in, a, you know, a sex club. You just had sex with women, like sex trafficked women, prostitutes? And he looked at me almost like he didn't know. Almost like it didn't click in his head until I said that. And he thought, oh. Women are very vulnerable in undeveloped countries where uh, the traffickers, the criminals come in and they say to the women, we can make you a movie star. And of course they start by uh, saying, you have to do this to get a foot in the door. Uh, they end up making the terrible porn movies and uh, becoming prostitutes in a a brothel somewhere in a bar somewhere. Detailed stories that just are so painful when I think about the woman on the other side of what he had done. And, you know, now when we talk about it, I see the pain in his eyes. And any country in the world that legalizes prostitution has more sex trafficking. It creates a permissive attitude and an attitude of further disrespect for women. Lauren Bethel said... Sexual trafficking is the exploitation of vulnerability. In other words, uh, women who, if they could choose to do something else, they would. So pornography creates the demand for prostitution and trafficking, and that's so important to understand. I think sex trafficking isn't just a foreign problem, something that happens in another country, somewhere else. It was going on in my neighborhood down the street from me. I can point them out. I know what to look for. He was working with a pimp who had been imprisoned, and he said, tell me how you find the girls that you use for your movies. And the pimp said, oh, it's easy. I just go to the malls. And he said, most teenage girls and preteen girls will go with their friends. If I see a girl who's alone, I go up to her, and I say, hey, you've got beautiful eyes. He said, if she looks at me and says, thank you, I let her go on because I know that she's not vulnerable. But if she looks down at her shoes and says, no, I don't have pretty eyes, he says, I know I've got her. It's impossible to be searching out adult pornography on the Internet without finding child pornography. And people will say, oh, no, I never look at child pornography. And I say, oh, really? You mean you've never seen a woman who's 17 and a half years of age? What about a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old? I was speaking in Arizona a few years ago, and uh, a prosecutor was there who prosecuted obscenity and sex crimes there in Arizona. And he's, he called adult pornography the gateway drug for child porn. And they're arresting many married men, grandparents, many high school kids, because they don't distinguish between adult and child pornography after a time. And so they're trying to make actresses look either pubescent or even prepubescent to sculpt those brain tastes younger and younger. That accounts for the worldwide uh, boom in child pornography, I believe. This consumption of adult pornography on a steady basis, where the brain looks and needs, looks for and needs harder material. One of my responsibilities was to work at a children's home where the children were court adjudicated away from their parents because the parents had used them for prostitution purposes and child pornography purposes. So these parents had actually taken pictures of their children and put them on the internet okay, for the sale. They had also sold their children at different parties and things for sexual favors. Um, it wasn't just one or two kids. We were dealing with 50, 60, 70, 100 different children 
who would have this take place in their lives. In more developed countries, the runaways, the castaways, the throwaway children are the ones who are so vulnerable because the criminal networks know where they are, they know how to find them, and they prey on them. Uh, the experts say that a child who runs away will probably be in the hands of a criminal network within 48 hours. Uh, individuals that uh, commit crimes against children, for example, sexual crimes against children, uh, report to a high uh, percentage that their issues began with pornography, that they find themselves needing more stimulation from things that they would never have originally uh, described as being sexually arousing to them. Every country should have laws prohibiting the distribution of adult and child pornography. Now, many people argue, well, it should be just child pornography. Adult pornography, you should do what you want. People should have that right. But when we know that looking at adult pornography leads many to child pornography, we have to go back to the source of the crime, and it's, it's adult pornography. When I walk into a room, I don't think, who in here struggles with pornography? Now I think, who in here hasn't encountered pornography in their lifetime? It is going to continue, and it's going to continue to take lives and drain them of every ounce of happiness. We need to do something about it. Knowledge is power. I, I firmly believe that, particularly with this, this addiction. The more people learn about the addiction, about the chemistry that happens in the brain during the addiction process and what an addict goes through, the more they will be able to be a support. I think it's so important for those that are struggling to always remember that there's not anything that's happened to you that you can't heal from. I finally see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and I know that there is for everyone. There's a great um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross quote about beautiful people. And she says that beautiful people just don't just happen, that the most beautiful people we have known have known despair and loss and misery and suffering. No one said it would be easy, but they said it would be worth it. And I can testify in my life that I've done you know, intense amounts of work, but where I am now, I, I, there's no place I'd rather be in. It's time for us to take very seriously what's happening in our cyber world, in our cyber universe. Just wake up to the fact that our children, our young adults, and our adults are all in this new, uh, brave new world, if you will. Things are not what they used to be even 10 years ago. Pornography is a universal solvent that dissolves emotion, family, marriage, and government. Indeed, it destroys our humanity. The war for safe families and decent communities is a winnable war. You are not too late to the battle. All hands on deck. The battle is on. We need you. We need your time, your energy, your efforts, your interest. Please join us in this fight for sanity and serenity for peace and prosperity, for today and for all our tomorrows. I am on a mission now to spread to all the world, to all the women, to anyone that will hear me. If we can all come together, and if we can all rally around and not be afraid to talk about it, and not be afraid to get educated, and not be afraid to work together and fight for the common good, then we will all start healing and our society will become better and will become stronger. Welcome back to the program. Clive, having just watched that devastating documentary um, and the harm and effects on, on especially young people, um, what are the implications do you think for South Africa? Errol, you know, we've been discussing this for years, but this documentary, I feel, really cuts to the chase. It's so um, apt 
not only for America, but for South Africa as well. You know, me, I've been involved with anti-pornography for 18 years. I've counseled thousands of men and couples in, you know, with this problem in their lives. And I can just see this escalating. And this is so truthful. It's so to the point. And it just shows and demonstrates some of the effects that this is, <clears throat> sorry, that this is um, creating in marriages, families, communities, societies. And so we have to take this seriously. It really is a major problem in society today. And it is a growing epidemic in South Africa today, in the church and um, in the rest of the country. You say that it's, it's a growing problem and we have to take it seriously. Do you think because you're doing this work at, at STOP. Uh, do you think the church, that government, that civil society is taking thing, uh, the pornography as seriously as it should? Um, let me start in the church because that's the area that I do most of my work in. Um, it's, it's epidemic in the church today. It really is. And there are um, newer facts, figures, statistics coming out daily about numbers of men that, uh, and women, you know, it's a growing phenomenon amongst women as well. Um, but it's a growing thing in the church today. It's a growing problem. And, you know, it is just robbing the church of its, of its leaders, of its men, of its, you know, it's just stealing from the church. It's stealing from God. And we need to address this issue. And it needs to be discussed more from the pulpit. Um, there, are, there are churches which are addressing the issue, but there are far too many that don't know how to address the issue and are not addressing it. And there are so many victims and, and people um, drawn into the addiction of pornography that it's very bad. Yeah, obviously, if, if many in the church, Christian men, are addicted to pornography and are struggling with this issue, the marriage uh, becomes a factor, the family, the children, all of those things are affected when men uh, are obviously compromised in this area. Now, uh, interestingly, George Barner, you know the George Barner Institute in the US, they, they put out a study recently that most Christian men in the US are viewing pornography, online pornography. You know, I think, Errol, we are not far behind the U.S. We don't have the finances or, or the people, you know, to do accurate statistics in this country. But I just know from my daily dealings with phone calls I get, emails I get, with people who are approaching us uh, for help, I can just see exponential growth year after year, where sometimes, you know, my calls double each year virtually, and that's the amount of people. So I do believe that, you know, we... In South Africa, the figures are very similar to America. And uh, it's something that needs to be addressed seriously because they are victims, uh, not only for, you know, in, in marriages, but the children. I'm seeing more and more younger kids um, who are being um, harmed in their developmental stages of life. You know, where they are training their brains to do things which are so unnatural. Now, even in this documentary, we see uh, most of the young men that participated in this uh, um, film um, access pornography, hardcore pornography on, online. Mm. So the easiest way to get a pornography is through the Internet. Young children, everybody's got a cell phone or a you know, a smartphone today, mm. and children as young as eight, you were telling me, can access hardcore pornography on these devices. Yes, you know, Errol, a few years ago, the, and it's still used quite uh, broadly, you know, they say the average age of first internet uh, pornography exposure for children is 12 years of age. But in recent uh, statistics, it looks as if that age has dropped to eight years old. So that is the average age that children are having access to all kinds of absolutely gruesome, gory, <laughs> to put it bluntly, pornography. You know, a lot of the time it's out of, uh, you know, they're inquisitive. Kids are naturally inquisitive about sex. But we as parents, we as, as adults, we have to protect our children. We have to put up the checks and balances and the blocks on cell phones. You know, uh, most of the cell phone companies today, you can block adult content uh, just by contacting them or doing it online yourself. Um, Parents don't know these things. We need to put checks and balances on our computers. You can put uh, canine web protection, which is a free adult content blocker on your, on your PCs and, and uh, mobile phones, etc. We need to do these things. And it's like you say, uh, it's not happening because people don't take this seriously enough. The threat of pornography, the widespread 
uh, um, easy accessibility to pornography that children, as you say, as young as eight years old are getting to it, young men getting addicted to pornography, and of course, their relationships with women is warped now. They, you know, they can't have normal relationships. And of course, men, adult men, more, more and more men getting addicted to pornography and the marriage is suffering as a result of that. What is your um, message then or your appeal uh, to firstly the church uh, and then secondly to our government to address this issue because you at the cold face of what is happening, you're counseling people, you, you, you're hearing from young people, um, even adults about the struggles they're having for, with pro pornography. So what would you say to the pastors out there? The pastors must address the situation. They must speak about it from the pulpits. Um, you know, if they don't, if they're not sure how to deal with these issues, uh, you know, they can contact us uh, through uh, Stop. You know, through our website, we'll help them where we can. Um, they must absolutely not, uh, you know, just say we'll pray about it and it'll go away. Yeah, prayer works, but in our experience, most of the time, it, there needs to be intervention. There needs to be checks and balances put in place. There needs to be support groups and things like that set up so that there is a hospital, so to speak, for these men um, and women to go to, to get the help and the, the support that is needed because it's a very yeah. private, embarrassing um, addiction. That's what they call it, the secret sin, Correct. because people struggle with this thing and they don't speak to others. So they have to make sure that it's open, it's confidential, uh, that people have the uh, confidence to go and speak to somebody about this and knowing they won't get condemned, mm -hmm. but they will receive the help they need. I think that will help a lot. And then the children, how do we deal with children accessing porn? What are the kind of things that parents can do uh, and our government? You know, for, well, from the government's point of view, um, I'm skeptical there, you know, especially with a uh, star set top TV bid to put pornography on on the airwaves, etc. You know, that is just absolutely crazy, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, where most countries are looking at drawing back, pulling back, making it more difficult for children to access pornography. We seem to be going the other way. So really, government needs to, in my opinion, needs to catch a wake-up call and really put in checks and balances and realize, you know, there is so much um, studies and information out there on the harms and dangers of pornography. No one has yet been able to convince me of any um, positive use or any positive thing that, that pornography can do for society. No one has, has shown us one thing, yet the, the abuse and the, the, the trafficking of women and children into the sex industry and all these things that go around it, it's devastating. We need to, as a united front, as Christians, we need to get together and we need to tell government and tell all the players involved how we feel about pornography so that the scourge can be stopped in its tracks. The mm. only way we're going to take control of it. Mm. Clive, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we need a united voice for people to take this seriously because this threat is spreading in South Africa. So I want to thank you for the work you do. It is vital work uh, uh, helping people, getting the message out there. It's so important. We commend you and we thank you for the work you do at STOP. God bless you. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm speaking to John Smythe of the Justice Alliance of South Africa, or more uh, commonly known as JASA, uh, about the documentary that we just uh, viewed now. Um, John, welcome to the Watchman on the Wall once again. Good Thank to you, have you back. Nice to be with you. We've, we've just viewed this documentary, and uh, the evidence is mounting. It's overwhelming that pornography is undeniably harmful to men, to children, yep. to women, and to society in general. Um, isn't it incredible that Top TV, now known as Starset, Top TV Starset, is still pushing ahead to broadcast hardcore pornography on South African television? Yeah, I, I quite agree with you. It's extraordinary, particularly since they're in business rescue. You know, mm. they're, they're, they've really got no money at all you'd think they would give this one up, and uh, just as a matter of common sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, following our victory, they have uh, put in a notice of appeal immediately, and that, of course, 
alas, in, entitled them to continue broadcasting. And that's why they did it. They had their notice of appeal in within 24 hours. Uh, whether they uh, lawfully broadcast that same evening as the judgment came out, I'm not sure. But that's why they did it, because the appeal, the notice of intention to appeal, suspends the uh, judgment uh, until the appeal is heard or until leave to appeal is granted. Yeah, so, so they can continue uh, broadcasting pornography on television. Yes, and obviously they are they, doing it. Yeah, and they're making money out of that, and, and, and they don't want that to stop because they're going to lose revenue. But g getting back to that victory, uh, firstly, I want to congratulate you, uh, the Justice Alliance of South Africa, yourselves, Cause for Justice, yes. and Doctors for Life, who, yes. who went on behalf of all decent people in South Africa and for the dignity and in, uh, of women and children. You fought this case uh, at the Western Cape High Court and you won. You won this victory. But I, our viewers need to understand you know, the implications of the victory. What actually happened? What did the judge rule? What does it mean? And what happens next? Right. Well, um, the, there were five days, Errol, of, le of legal argument. There were no witnesses called in this case. It's all done on paper, on affidavit. But the lawyers, four of them, you see, uh, three for the applicants, no, five of them, three for the applicants, the three applicants you mentioned, and uh, one each for uh, uh, Starset. In fact, they're called ODM now, just to complicate it even further, but uh, they're the people putting out the porn, and one for a caster, of course. So there were five advocates, and uh, the judge uh, initially heard the case for four days, and then he was still troubled by it, and he called counsel back for a fifth day. And that really was because the law is very technical and very obscure. And I'm sorry to have to say this, but legislation was rush, rushed through in 1996, around that sort of era when, uh, when the new South Africa came into being. And uh, there are problems with it. And uh, so the judge had to untangle this mass of legislation. But the point is that um, uh, he has said quite clearly uh, that there are grounds uh, for this to go back to ECASA and look at it again, look at the whole thing again in the light of the fact that they misunderstood the law. Now just, just again, for our viewers' sake, uh, just to take them back to what happened in April 2013, we and a number of other Christian organizations went to ICASA. Now ICASA is the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa that regulates all broadcasting in South Africa. Right. And so um, Top TV Starset applied for a license to broadcast porn in a previous ruling, ICASA turned that down in 2012. They refused it on the grounds that it's harmful to women. In 2013, uh, Top TV stars had went back to ICASA, made the same application for a license to broadcast three hardcore pornographic uh, channels on South African television. This time, ICASA did a about turn and granted them the license. The thing that what happened at that hearing at ICASA in Johannesburg in April 2013 was that Organizations like Family Policy Institute and others that made uh, presentations were not properly prepared. Uh, Top TV came with uh, very uh, high-priced lawyers uh, fighting a legal battle while we came just talking, give, giving evidence and, and social studies and research about the harm of pornography. And of course, because they had the lawyers, they won the case. And so... Uh, Justice Alliance of South Africa, Doctors for Life, and Cause for Justice then challenged ICASA's uh, granting of a license exactly. to Top TV yeah. Starset uh, and, and, and that law of general application that they said wasn't there. Yes. Um, and you have won. So we'll take it from there. Yes. yes. Let me just put it in, in, in a nutshell. The real issue was this, and the judge explained this in his judgment. The real issue was, were ICASA under obligation to look at the content of the programs, the content, and decide is this something which, which, which should go out into, the, uh, uh, into a home, the small living room in a home where their television set is so intrusive. Were they uh, 
allowed to do that? Were they entitled to do that? Were they under an obligation to do it? Or were, as your high-priced lawyers for, for Starset uh, claimed, is, was it just a rubber stamping exercise? And ICASA held that it was a rubber stamping exercise. We, we, we don't have to look at it. They did make some observations, but they said we got it wrong first time because we thought we could consider all these things. Now we've been persuaded that we can't. Mm. But the judge said that was wrong. They should have looked into the whole thing. So maybe when they look it, into it again, they'll go back to where they were first time. But I read somewhere that uh, um, um, top TV star sets description of the hardcore pornographic um, content that they're putting on television was, you know, just romantic people exactly. kissing. It was, it was quite appalling. I, I mean, our counsel uh, brought this out very clearly. He, he, he summarized it in this way. He said uh, the, the way that Starset presented it was uh, couples in stable relationships gazing lovingly into each other's eyes. And oh. then, the, then we, we showed the judge the titles of the uh, programs going out on the channels. And they, I mean, I wouldn't repeat them on the air. I didn't understand some of the words. It was the worst sort of promiscuous, hardcore pornography. And, and uh, so, you know, that's no doubt one of the reasons, though it wasn't the particular reason he seized on in his judgment, but there's, I'm sure it's one of the reasons why he said, Casa, Casa, I've got to look at this. Otherwise, Errol, it would be a nonsense, you see. It would mean that Parliament say, if you make a movie to show in the cinema, it's got to be classified. It's got to go through all the stages and come out with a classification. And, of course, the Film and Publication Board can refuse a certificate altogether. Uh, but if what Starset was saying was correct, it would mean Parliament says, oh, if it's for broadcasting, you can put anything on it, and, and it casts it, just rubber stamps it. It's a nonsense. It just doesn't comply with common sense. And, and this is a hundred times worse because it's going into people's living rooms. Television. Absolutely. Children, it's intrusive. Children have television sets in their, in their, in their bedrooms. Um, this is incredible. So. We've, we've won the appeal. The, okay. the review, as the it's review. called. Okay. And uh, now they have a, a um, star set, ODM, whatever you call them, Top TV, have appealed. At the moment, and this is very interesting, ICASA have not appealed. You see, that we've got two respondents, yes. and the order is, about, is against both of them. Well, now they've got, uh, I think they've got one more uh, day, uh, certainly long before the end of the month, they will have to make up their decision. They will have to make up their mind whether they're going to appeal. Mm. Um, I think the deadline, we, we, we will know, is, is, is November the 20th. So if Top TV star said if they lose this appeal, it means that we have to go through the whole process again. And it has to go back to a car say, unless they drop it. But uh, Errol, you know, I, I think we need to pray very much that, that uh, uh, that first of all, they won't be granted leave to appeal. You see, the judges dealt with this whole issue of whether the order should be suspended and they should be allowed to go on showing the channels in his judgment. So I think there's a very good chance that he will say, no, I've already looked at this and I don't think you should have leave to appeal. And particularly if a casa are not appealing. And uh, therefore, if we don't hear anything from a casa and they keep out of it, I think it's much more likely that leave for, to appeal will be refused. And the hearing date for that is December the 5th. Okay. So what happens if, if the judge does not grant, uh, grant them leave to appeal? Just explain in layman's Well, they, they, yes, they have, they have two options. Either they can petition the Supreme Court of Appeal which means they have to, uh, they bypass the judge's refusal. They, they, they say the judge has refused us, uh, but we still want leave to appeal. And they ask the judges in the Supreme Court of Appeal, please give us leave to appeal. Uh, but of course, if, 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 if the judge gives a, another reasoned judgment as to why he thinks they shouldn't have leave and why they should go back to ICASA, they're unlikely to do that, I think. And the cost implications of this are enormous. Uh, Starset are all, and ICASA together are already facing a bill of costs, their own costs plus our costs, three applicants, one and our costs will be one and a half million. That's a thumbs up figure. Mm. So the, the, there's huge money involved. Now, the other option, if they refuse leave to appeal, 
uh, they will uh, give up the idea of appealing this judgment and go back to Akasa and fight it before Akasa in the same way when you were involved last time. Which means uh, Family Policy Institute and other organizations is going to have to go back to Akasa, make our case again, this time taking our lawyers. So John, tell, tell us what's happening on the 5th, uh, why that date and day is important and you can speak directly to the Christians out there, make the appeal because I think uh, we need to pray. Yes, ab absolutely. Well, the hearing on, on the 5th before the same judge, Judge Bozilek, with all the counsel there, will be relatively short. I think it's fixed for 11.30 on Friday the 5th. And we would expect it to be just an hour or so, although, of course, the history of this case suggests it might be otherwise. But uh, he will simply hear arguments from, uh, from, from all sides, from the three applicants and uh, from Starset and Akasa if they become involved, but they may not be there. And then he will make up his mind probably immediately. He might take time to, to, to decide that. Mm. But that will be a short hearing. And... Uh, I think it, it's unlikely to, to, uh, to be something which uh, he doesn't decide on immediately because he's really anticipated these matters in his judgment. Mm. And I'm very optimistic that he will refuse leave to appeal, particularly if Akasa don't join in. But I think we want to pray about that, you know, and I would ask the Christian public really to get praying on December the 5th that the judge will be given wisdom to say, no, uh, if you think you should appeal, you go off to the Supreme Court of Appeal, in which case I guess the financial aspects of all this will be such that they won't do that. Yes. Or why don't you go back to Akasa? What's wrong going with going back to Akasa? I can hear the judge saying that. That's right. uh, and, but then, of course, we've got a, a big battle on, on our hands unless the whole thing becomes too much financially and they give up. Do you know, your, in, your viewers would be interested to know this, that they have only 400 subscribers to, the, to these channels. I know that, yes. Uh, I, I was uh, d debating this on, on the radio at the weekend, on Sunday actually, with, with somebody from ODM uh, on digital media who are star sets of people. And uh, he said, oh, well, that's, that's just because we're not uh, pushing it much at the moment. But Jeremy Maggs, who was the interviewer, w w was really very derisive about it, you know. Why, why are you making all this fuss if only 400 people want it? Why yeah. not give up? <laughs> oh, yeah, and they try to make people yeah. believe there's this huge market for yeah, pornography uh, on television and, and it's all deception. So, John, we want to thank you once again for, um, for fighting this case, fighting on behalf of women and children and the vulnerable members of society. Uh, Jas is doing a great job. Uh, thanks to uh, Doctors for Life, Cause for Justice as well. Continue the fight. And uh, I sent out an, an alert while, before you guys went to court. Um, I believe millions of Christians prayed and we prevailed. Yes, yes. Uh, and so we're asking you to do the same. On the fifth, Friday, the 5th of December, Jasa, uh, Doctors for Life and Cause for Justice will be going back to the High Court uh, to uh, oppose this appeal by ODM Top TV star set and we need the, the judge to, to refuse them leave for appeal. So pray into that, that God gives the judge wisdom, that God will give wisdom and strength to the Christian attorneys fighting this case. And uh, John, thank you, God bless you, and we, you we wish you well. Joy to be on your program. <laughs>